you tell us uh, a little bit about your own story and how you got involved in, in shamanism? Yeah, I got involved. I, my whole life I've been a seeker. And I have sought, I've been to 35, 40 countries around the world. I lived in a monastery for a little while. I've always been searching outside of myself for an answer that's the whole time resided within. And when I came upon this particular path, the language, it just, I came upon a very serendipitous sort of way and wound up at a lecture one day that changed the entire course of my life. And I realized that this, this actually put language to everything that I was looking for. And what, what do you think it was about your earlier life that made you a, a seeker? I think I, I chose this path in my life. I, I come from a beautiful place. Anything that I've needed to find, I'd have to go and look on my own. So I've chose a particularly tough journey this, this lifetime. And I guess it was, the journey's been all about my own personal healing, looking for that part that has not been accessible to me. So I've searched, that's how it began. And that, that began as a small child. I have no re recollection of my life before the age of 12. And so, however that all trans transpired from 12 on, I've been really looking. And that's sort of, that's how I got here. So, and that's the path that I picked probably before I came even to this lifetime. Could you tell us a little bit, I know that you've done a lot of work with uh, rehabilitation and shamanism and that sort of thing. Can you tell us how that evolved? My, my path has been one of great exposure to um, different aspects of chemical addiction. In our culture, chemical addiction is sort of singled out, but it's only one of hundreds of ways or millions of ways that people are not present for their lives. And it becomes a way of escaping, not being present. The, the pain of being present in the moment is too great and therefore our best option at that moment is to pick up something that to be self-destructive. So the current paradigm of healing addiction is running its course and I've had a lot of exposure to different sorts of healing modalities and conventional, conventional therapy works only on the literal world and in shamanic practice we deal with four levels of engagement for the world and that brings a lot more energy to it. So in my path I've been dead a couple of times, I've been in umpteen treatment environments, I've been in more groups counseling, you name it, I've, I've been able to experience that. My whole 30-year journey with that has led me to this particular moment to realize that healing can happen in a moment when we bring our soul essence back to us and have that energy available to us we can go back and actually do the healing before the wounding ever happens so a soul retrieval and an extraction and some of the work that I've learned here has been very effective and my work is actually to bridge that gap between conventional Western outlook on addiction treatment and to actually introduce healing. So where we come from, I believe that we can actually heal addiction. We can transcend addiction. It's not to identify with sickness. It's actually to move beyond. So I often ask people, do you want to be in recovery or would you like to be recovered? And as we recover our true essence, then we have the energy to move forward and bring forth our gifts. Everybody on this planet has a different DNA code and a different energetic signature. All six billion people, there are no two exactly alike. Therefore, Spirit wants us to bring forth our true voice, our true essence, and I think a lot of the cultural wounding that we have, a lot of what gets people involved in addictions in the first place is not being encouraged, not knowing how to put forth that their true authentic being. So if I under, understand this correctly, <clears throat> um, you, you feel that, that the shamanic healing uh, actually heals you and as opposed to some other alternatives to addiction. Like for example, if I understand that correctly, uh, AA always says, well, you're always an alcoholic. You don't really get cured of it. You just kind of control it or live with it. And so if I understand what you're saying is there is, when taking this other approach, 
that you can actually be recovered rather than in recovery. Is that, is that right or is that yes. simplifying it? Or well, it's, it, that is the essence and we, if we combine quantum physics and shamanism and they are actually the same concept spoken in two different languages. So in quantum physics we realize that there is no such thing as time. And so when we, in our Western paradigm of addiction treatment, we look at, a, you know, it's always the cure. It's always about dealing with something after it's manifested. So what we look at in the energetic medicine component is sort of the cause. What is the cause of an addiction? What is that? All of this stuff is just a symptom. It's the manifestation of the initial cause. So when we work at the cause level, which is, again, not sort of that disconnect to our true essence, to our true being, so we can actually go back in time, bring those pieces back, and, and heal before wounding actually happens. You mentioned four levels of healing, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so could you tell us what the four levels are? Yeah, the four levels of, of healing, of engagement with the world, the literal, which we're all used to, that's this, what we can see, touch, taste, those are the stories that we get trapped in. Then we move to the mythic realm, and, or I'm sorry, that, then the symbolic. And we're all used to symbols. When we see an octagonal red sign, for example, we don't need to see that it says stop in order to be cued that that's a stop sign. Or religious symbols, crosses and stars and, and so forth. Cue us symbolically. We go to the level of the, the mythic, which is the great story. That is the realm of poetry and songs and ceremony. Rumi can capture a war and peace size book in three sentences and that keys us, that cues us in a certain way that's that's different from those other two levels and finally we go into the level of pure energy and energy is energy organizes matter so all matter in the universe came if you subscribe to the Big Bang Theory came from energy and manifested into matter so Physics without chem or chemistry without energy is is a dead sort of science. So, energy organizes all of matter. God is energy. Well, there are many, many, many names for God, and in my viewpoint, God, Buddha, Krishna, the source, the field, is all different ways of naming one organizing principle of the universe, one energy called by many, many names. Um, could you uh, tell us what the soul retrieval process is? You, you mentioned it in passing. I assume it's probably complicated, but if you give us a simple... Well, the soul retrieval... The, the, okay. Okay. the soul retrieval process is a process whereby a lot of times we'll have wounding, and wounding trauma, let's go to that word, trauma we Trauma looks however a trauma is for you. So trauma doesn't always have to be that your father did this and you had this horrible life. Trauma is whatever we consider to be threatening as typically in a young being we're much more vulnerable than we are when we're older. We're defense, we come into this world defenseless. And what happens in a threatening situation, a piece of us, in Western culture we look at, a piece shuts down. It's not uncommon to hear that people, when they have some horrible thing that has happened to them, will have no recollection of it. It's not available in their memory. They've blocked it out. And what Western psychiatry will do is sort of try to wake that piece up or, or however they go about it. In the energetic world and in shamanic traditions all over the planet, the belief is that a soul part becomes unavailable to you and actually goes to its place of origin, which is in the in the earth, in the, to the lower world, and that piece is also no longer available to us. Through shamanic practice, we can actually journey for someone, go and retrieve that part for them, and bring it back, and bring it back as a quanta of energy that is now available to them. And what that does, it allows for more wholeness. When we have a part of ourselves that is not available to ourselves, we are not whole. And this is about wellness and wholeness. So our goal is to be whole. So when we bring back a soul part in real time, that day, we now have a quanta of energy that's available to us. Now it takes time 
in the literal level to integrate that peace. It's not, it's not as though you get a soul retrieval and all of a sudden your life just falls back into whatever balance. But now you have the component to get back. You, you sort of, when we have trauma, our destiny line is altered and now we bring in experience to, to support our altered destiny. And that looks like a lot more opportunities to heal, a lot more sort of wacky situations that we get ourselves into. When we do a soul retrieval, we actually shift that energy back towards what we came here to be, and then we begin to manifest experiences that support us on that journey as well. Um, can, you, um, can you tell us a little bit about the work you've done in Sedona and how you've incorporated these principles into uh, uh, rehabilitation? Yeah, I am... I am the, the founder of a place called the Sanctuary at Sedona, which the state of Arizona calls us an extended care drug and alcohol treatment facility. Um, what I call us and what we are, the vision is that we are a healing center for those that are caught in the trap of self-destructive behavior. And a lot of times what we'll do, they might stop their primary addiction. Let's say that's alcohol. And unless there's healing that will happen, our lives will become out of balance in some other way. So work is an can be an addiction, for example. The people then might get caught in out of balance work, out of balance food, out of balance sex, out of balance entertainment, out of balance computer shopping, whatever that might be. Ultimately that's going to come up short for them and many times people gravitate back to their primary addiction, which again in this case would be alcohol. So what what our vision is is to create healing. What we've done is our primary focus is energy medicine. We also combine high vibrational food, a lot of raw food, a lot of organic foods, and, and we actually grow that food and in support of the healing process. Our, our hospitals are notorious for having food that is not so good. And during the healing process, what more important time to integrate food that has live energy, that has life force. So we have that component, and we also combine that with traditional clinical counseling as well to integrate all this healing that happens. So we offer everything that is available in conventional treatment, but then we combine these other modalities too to create an environment for healing, for a very intensive healing. And that is the vision. We have a lot of energy behind it and a lot of support. A lot of people are moving to this sort of philosophy in the treatment arena today. Can you give us an example? I, kind of, I mean, it can be based on a real person. It can be hypothetical. You know, I come to your center and let's say I have a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction. What would be the process that I would go through? Um, at the center. I realize it would be different for everybody, but let's say if there's some kind of standard well, steps. The, the standard steps is to figure out, to sort of get a handle on where healing needs to happen for you. So this is all about your own personal healing and reconnecting you to your sort of epic soul's journey. So you would get a chance to talk some, to some folks, to get evaluated, and as you integrate it into the community there, the healers would sort of find you and you would find them. So you might be more of a Reiki acupuncture person. You might go directly to the shamanic healing. Most people that that have experience with chemical addiction need certain shamanic work or can benefit from certain shamanic work all of the time. And a soul retrieval, as we had just discussed, is one of them and a couple of other procedures. And that looks different for every person, but the essence is much the same, to reconnect you to really who you are. Now, I know also in shamanic work there's different levels too. So is there an emphasis on ceremony? Is there an emphasis on um, other levels of it? For, for the work that I do, we were often in ceremony. We, we try to move away from this paradigm that ceremony happens on Sundays at whatever service of your choice might be. Each moment of our lives is a ceremony. We're just not so good as humans at remembering that all the time. So when we tap into the sacredness of our own lives, for example, if you believe that your life is important and mythic and epic, then it is. If you don't believe that your life is important and mythic and epic, then it's not. 
So through ceremony, we tap into that energetic world that we were talking about earlier. Ceremony's all energy. We don't know why people have come around fires since the beginning of time to tell stories and share their mythology, but they have in every tradition. We don't know exactly how that works. There might be a lot of theories around it. It's, it's like describing God. There are volumes of books written about that particular subject that probably don't even scratch the surface of really the true essence. Our minds can't get around that. So we incorporate a lot of ceremony because our lives are ceremony. Our lives are our lives are sacred every moment. So we tap into that and the more we do ceremony, the more we remind ourselves of that. We do a lot of body sort of cellular memory release when yoga and certain kinds of body movement is great for that. So that becomes a meditative practice. So stillness and awareness become very important in the healing process if we can do it. We all know, for example, that if we meditated for five minutes a day, said a good affirmation, ate better food, and and so forth, that we would feel better. But so few of us actually take those sh short few minutes to do that every day to improve our lives. So what we do is try to integrate it so it becomes something that becomes a part of us. We've moved away from sort of the, the concept of tools to the concept of practices. So we don't talk about tools in a lot of treatment today. There's the tools, I have this tool, that tool, this tool, that tool. A tool becomes an inanimate object. You have a hammer in your garage, but you need to put in a nail. You might use your shoe to do it because you don't feel like going out to get the tool. So that's an inanimate object that you may or may not choose to interact with. A practice becomes part of our being. So the practice of life, the practice of living, the practice of ceremony, the practice of sacred space, sacred moments, our sacred breath, that then becomes integrated and becomes part of our lives. Our, our greater vision is about bringing this paradigm and sharing it with the world because as I said chemical addiction is just one aspect of people not being present in their lives so as we share this this is not about only my client base that I work with every client that I'm blessed to work with then moves forth in the world and goes and shares their gifts with their corner of the world and that creates a, a synergistic effect so this is about, as we are all currently doing our work in our own individual expression, it has a huge impact on the world. I was of the mindset back, back in the day that, well, what, what can I do? What does my little input mean? And I realize in, as we connect to spirit, as we connect to our journeys, that our impact is profound. When we are moving towards our healed state to our wholeness, we send a ripple out into the universe that has profound impact on those around us in ways that we don't even realize. We step into authentic being. That becomes very contagious. So the sort of the global picture is to help those to find their path, to tap into really who they are, to bring forth their gifts that they came to this lifetime to bring. And as we do that, the entire world shifts and it shifts energetically and we we're building momentum for this kind of healing work on this planet today.